And we're back with Mr. Terry Pratchett. Welcome, sir. Hi. Now, the Monstrous Regiment is the 31st Discworld novel and uh, is an interesting examination of uh, a number of different themes. You have a young lady, Polly Oliver, who uh, goes... Well, Polly and subsequently Oliver, I Polly. think. Polly. <laughs> well, Polly, and who becomes Oliver Perks. That's right, yeah. As she disguises herself as a boy as to search for her brother, who mm -hmm. has joined the local army and mm -hmm. is, has disappeared. And with this as the starting point, we examine a number of different themes, including, the, including what is one's sexual identity as she goes through this series of experiences as a man and compares it to the way she was treated <laughs> as a woman. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, at one point, she realizes that she is, in fact, a woman who is disguised as a man who is disguised as a woman disguised as a man, which can actually be quite complicated. I would say so, yes, actually. And, and for those of us, those of our, our, our watchers who aren't familiar with where this is taking place, can you give just a very quick description of exactly what the disc world is? Well, this is, there's a kind of problem for me in this. I mean, this world was, was conceived as, if you like, the antidote to fantasy stories. I came, uh, came up with the idea in the um, early 80s. The disc world is a flat world which is balanced on the back of four elephants, which are themselves on the back of a giant turtle. And that's an image based out of world mythology. I can show you woodcuts of it. It's, it's, it's absolutely ancient. All right, having, uh, having learned that, you now have to forget it, because on the surface, it's, it's your consensus fantasy universe, you know, the ones with the trolls and the vampires and, and, and the elves and everything, except that it's taken seriously. And if you take it seriously, it becomes funny. So. Uh, a lot of the books are set in the city of Ankh-Morpork, Pork, which is kind of a cross between Tudor London and, and modern New York. I mean, there are trolls and there are dwarves and there are vampires, and the vampires work down at the kosher butchers, and the trolls do the heavy work, and and and, and everyone's there to make a buck. Uh, and, and if you like, the concerns are often quite modern concerns against a background which will remind you of a lot of fantasy stories. And, and over the course of these 31 books, you've had an, a, an opportunity to examine a number of different subjects that were of interest to you at the time, mm. to examine various aspects of human behavior, to examine various aspects of various cultures. And you've also had, uh, you've also had a number of characters in these novels that kind of act as a thread, tying them together as they pop in and out of different stories where they might not necessarily be the primary character. I'm glad you said that. You said it a lot better than I could. I might as well go home now. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah. I, I didn't realize, I mean, I'd never realized exactly that I was doing it like that. I was just having tremendous fun and incidentally getting paid quite a lot of money. But yeah, I was, that's, that's marvelous. Thank you very much. Now, 31 novels, I mean. But I've got to be slightly careful here. Some of them aren't exactly novels. I mean, uh, one of them is 40,000 words long. Two of them are children's books, but I think a children's book is still a novel. Um, but but I, 30, uh, 31 volumes is probably the right one. And, and over the last, say, eight or nine years, increasingly people have been commenting on what they perceive as a change in the tone mm -hmm. and the way that, that you are writing and the things that you are examining. Uh, talking about a deepening of you as a writer and more and becoming more of a pure satirist rather than a humorist. How do you view yourself in terms of your development as a writer over the course of these 31 stories? It's probably true that the initial Discworld books were, I mean, and being picking my language with care, were more like, so we say, classic peers, Anthony, Craig Shaw Gardner, even Douglas Adams. I mean, that's the kind of territory. Uh, the reason they've evolved over the years is I think that I have as well. Um, if I was still writing the same kind of book 21 years later, which is a, what basically it is now, then there would be something wrong with me. And also I found early on that there was something called the joy of plot, that, that, <laughs> that, that you, should, you should write a book which would stand by itself, even if there was no humor. And I found also that the humor could, would evolve from a situation. Um, you didn't really have to work hard at it. It would turn up if you got the initial conditions right. I'm not certain the books are dark, although I know what you mean. I, I think 
they're, they're funny in the same way that MASH is funny. I mean, MASH is funny at the same time they're working in a hospital and people are getting uh, dying. But you know, they're human beings, and human beings find some way to, to, to live with stuff. Before you became known as a fantasy humorist, fantasy novelist, you spent a great, a, a significant portion of your life as a journalist. Mm, most of it. What impact did that experience have on your approach to writing your books? About the same size as the one that killed the dinosaurs, I think, because I learned it. <laughs> you know, I'm small town newspapers by and large, and you get to see all kinds of people in all kinds of situations, often situations that they'd rather not be seen in. And you cover a few murders, and, and you kind of learn how society works, and you meet politicians. Um, and you're not allowed to have writer's block because editors come along and scream at you if you do. You're aware of the readers out there, and you learn that uh, a word that is not read is a word that has not been fully written. Um, and above all, you learn to produce. You know, people say, what kind of conditions do you need to write? And I say, well, a keyboard helps. You know, <laughs> my handwriting is, is very bad. But um, enough space to get me in a keyboard is, is, is probably all that's required. I saw a panel you were on several years ago in Chicago, mm -hmm. and you were demonstrating how you tend to try to, when something pops into your head, as an idea, a phrase, mm -hmm. you tend to jot it down, and you're, you em have embraced modern technology as a tool to do so. Uh, what, uh, how has, has the new technologies, the ability to store stories, the ease of editing and everything else, how has it affected you, the process of creating going from the beginning of an idea to developing a storyline to completing a novel? I think there are pluses and minuses. Um, but from my point of view, I don't use chapters, and people think this is kind of weird. And I say, well, you know, Picasso didn't paint a picture, you know, one square foot at a time. I never quite, I've never quite got the hang of why you need chapters. In a children's book, sure, because Mum and Dad say, OK, we'll read up to the end of the chapter, because I don't want them there till 3 in the morning, and so I put the chapters in. Um, I'm working on a book currently. Um, I always start a, a new book immediately after I finished the last one. Uh, this was on the advice of the late Douglas Adams, and it is advice which, regrettably, he never actually followed himself. But when you finish a book, you have a lovely warm glow, and you've been mm -hmm. working very, very hard, and so you have now you know, a bit of pent-up steam. And so you start the next book. Uh, you get 10,000 words down, and then you start to wonder what the book is actually about. Um, trust me, it works. And using a word processor, especially a reasonably fast one, means that you can work very nearly on the whole novel at once. You go back and forth. You, you change this condition. You change that condition. Um, I shall probably regret saying this. It's a bit like modeling with clay. You can keep changing all the time. You can change the shape all the time. You're not committed, you know, you don't have to start to the bottom and then that's baked, and then up the next bit and then that's baked. You can change everything all the time until the end. It sounds like absolute chaos, doesn't <laughs> it? But if you know what you're doing, it's possible. Now, how do you know when it's done? Do you use the journalistic approach of, I have a deadline, now it's done, or? Deadlines aren't really the important thing, because if you added up all my deadlines over the years, I'm now something like eight years ahead of deadline. Oh, well, um, very good. <laughs> but I'm beginning to, beginning to slow down a bit now, I have to say. Uh, they say that books are never done. They're only abandoned. But, but there, there comes a point where you think, I could work for another month on this and improve it by 1%. And, and you know, I won't actually say you think good enough for folk music, but there is a kind of point where you think, this is about as good as I can do. And in any case, I've been driven insane because I've had this book <laughs> in my head for six months. <laughs> and you read, well, you, know, when you read it backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, and so does your editor. And you can't remember what sequence things happen anymore or what you should know at any one time. And that's about telling you it's done. This, this book is finished. Let's go back to something else we talked about just a bit earlier, and that's about these continuing characters that you mm -hmm. have that help tie some of the novels together. And, and they alternate back and forth. Yeah, I mean, yeah. people have arbitrarily set them aside as different. There are the stories of the witches. There are the right. stories of the guard. Uh, there are the stories uh, that feature death and mm -hmm. his granddaughter, Susan. Uh, and yet you have other books where you have very vivid, uh, uh, very popular characters mm -hmm. that appear once and then, quite honestly, are never seen again. 
How does that happen? What, what, well, what, I, how does one graduate into a continuing character? I think that I think the first thing we have to lay down very clearly is that there are actually no rules. Um, to an extent, Discworld, any Discworld, Discworld book is readable in its own right, and I've been fairly careful about that, but there is what I call the Star Trek phenomenon. Let's, um, let's, let's assume that you're tuning into Star Trek halfway through the first series. Okay, there's this guy with pointy ears. But no one's actually saying, gosh, he's got pointy ears. You know, it's just, he's got pointy ears, and no one is telling you why. So you think, oh, well, I quite like this. You know, the girls have got short skirts, you know, the scenery <laughs> is wobbling, but it's okay. <laughs> and if I watch for long enough, um, someone will actually remark about this guy's a Vulcan and he's got pointy ears and because he's an alien, and okay. And there's an element of that to Discworld. Um, every story stands by itself, but it will include quite often characters which have their own history, and if you know that history, that may broaden your enjoyment of the story. Um, sometimes there are characters that really step out of the book, and it's a great shame to wave goodbye to them. But sooner or later, you realize that you are not running the Superheroes League of America. You have too many major characters, characters who are so big that they span books. And, and uh, We have Death, there's Granny Weatherwax, there's Commander Vimes of the City Watch. These are useful characters. But if every character is going to go on living and going to continue being a main character, you get one of these cramped situations where Superman has to go on vacation so that Batman has got something <laughs> to do. You know? Exactly. Um, exactly. So the, 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 uh, there are lots of minor characters that, that, that also link the books. You know, Gaspo, the, the, the talking dog, the librarian of Unseen University, death to an extent, that, that knit them all together I, I, into, a, I suppose, a whole made of lots and lots of separate parts. Uh, Monstrous Regiment contains no real well, it does contain one major character from another book, but, but you don't see them as a major character. That is a great deal. That, that's something I ha have discovered. It's fun to take a character who the readers love. The readers really like. They've seen them in a lot of books. They've seen their internal monologue. And then mm -hmm. you introduce them to someone else's story. And they don't act in any different way, but they appear to be different people because they're being seen through another character's eyes. Rather than through their own. Rather yeah. like hearing your own voice when it's recorded exactly, and played yeah. back to you. And that, that kind of, that, that kind of uh, um, throws people a little bit, and, and they rather enjoy that. You, you realize that, that, like Commander Vimes of the Watch, people are very sympathetic to him. He, he's a bit rough and tough. He's a bit like kind of Dirty Harry grown older. Uh, seen from the point of view of another character, you know, he's a bully. Uh, he throws his way about. He doesn't care much about human rights. You think, well, actually, this is kind of true, but we never <laughs> see it like that because we see him from inside his own. And we head. see his rationalizations for his actions. Yeah, yeah, and, and we act. know he's a good guy. That's the point. We know that he's a good guy, so we accept the little peccadilloes. The this whole universe you've created, of course, first became wildly popular in Britain, Europe, and Australia, and as a result, in Britain especially there has grown this kind of ancillary industry, mm -hmm. this world industry. You have figurines, there are the calendars, yeah, yeah. there are things like uh, Naniog's cookbook. I have a copy of it here on the table. All of these things that have come out of it, some of them that you only have minor participation in in terms mm. of say, oh, that's nice, yes, that's correct, or something like ah, that. Point of order. So, um, if it includes the written word, my participation is major. For the figurines and things like that, obviously not. But no, there is no. There's never been a case of, as it were, franchising it to some other guy to write a book and give me all the money. But it, you've also had uh, several of these novels have been turned into uh, plays mm. that are performed regularly by small community theaters mm. in England, which leads me to what I wanted to talk about. I'm sneaking up on it here. Uh, you've devised a rather unique way of allowing people to use. Your creative, crea oh. your creations, uh, and benefit something else. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with the orangutan fund? Well, yeah, I wish it. I wish it was more honourable uh, than it is. I started making a lot of money from people that wanted me to go and talk. You know, just give talks and literary festivals and things. Um, um, 
And sometimes I realised I was getting money from people that couldn't really afford to pay me, schools and so forth. On the other hand, um, since I have been chairman of the Society of Authors, I didn't want to give people the idea that authors are free, because lots of authors actually rec rely on lecture fees and things. So um, the kind of simple way was to take the money and give it to charity, but which charity? Well, the orangutan librarian is, is very, very popular. So I phoned up the orangutan uh, foundation uh, in the UK and said, I'm getting all this money, would you like it? And there was this long pause, <laughs> and they said, uh, yes. Um, and that's been very useful because uh, about, I think, 10 or 11 of the Discworld books have been adapted into plays. Um, and uh, the royalties from them go to the Orangutan Foundation, and they are quite a, an appreciable amount of in the UK, their annual earnings. And it's a lot of fun for me because I try and get to see the plays and I get a big kick out of it. Um, and we, we do get the occasional approach from the US, I have to say, but, but Americans, being, you should excuse the phrase, American, find it a little hard to deal with the situation because no one signs contracts. Uh, I, just, I just write a letter saying, yeah, you are authorized to do this as a play, you know, in such and such a place, from such and such a day to someone else, and that's fine, and send the money to the Orangutan Foundation. And Americans like, you know, lots and lots of pages. <laughs> We, we tend to be obsessed with legal structure, yes. Yeah, well, say, I'm, so like, I'm going to sue. I'm, you know, I've written a letter saying, you can do this. I'm going to sue you for doing it. it you know. in, in, the, in, in the UK, and, and indeed, I have to say, over most of the rest of the world, it's actually possible to take someone at their word. I say, you promise me you're going to give them the money, you can do the play. Uh, another point, uh, lately, several of the most of your more popular books, uh, including the... Uh, Amazing Maurice and his Educated oh, Rodents, which won the Carnegie Award, congratulations, okay. have been targeted, at least by the publishers, at the young adult market. Oh, by what, me too, I have to say. Was, was that, did, what uh, made you decide that you wanted to point yourself directly at that audience? Uh, the first book I ever wrote was a children's book, and I have done six other children's books since then, quite apart from the two Discworld ones. As a matter of fact, one is being republished here in the U.S., actually the trilogy, the Bromeliad. Yeah, the Bromeliad trilogy, which, in fact, uh, DreamWorks are going to film. Um, so it's not like it's something new. Uh, I like writing for kids. Um, there is a difference in style. I, it's almost impossible to tell you what it is. You know, I, my, my get-out clause is that the man on the tightrope can't tell you how he keeps his balance. I know when I'm writing a children's book. The big kicker is I get a lot less money. I don't know the, the case here in the US. I, it actually, it is pretty much the same. Um, but certainly it's traditional in the UK that you get about, I don't know, like a quarter or a fifth of the kind of advance you would get for an adult mm -hmm. book. Yes. Um, for various historical reasons, some of which aren't entirely fair. <laughs> but uh, so, so if the author says it's, for, it's a children's book, not an adult's book, that, that author is putting their money behind their claim, or rather, their lack of money behind that claim. Um, it gives me a freedom, a freedom that the adult books don't give me. Again, I'm not certain I could quite tell you what that freedom is, but it allows me to approach things from a slightly different direction. Uh, also, I have to say that you've got writing for adults, you've got writing for children. Uh, one group is, dis is concerned with, with the major problems facing mankind, questions of loyalty and belief and heroism, and the really serious things that involve us as a species, and the others be called adults. Writing for kids actually enables you to deal with really serious things in quite a serious way that somehow you can't manage in an adult book. Now, if you ask me how, I'll tell you I don't know, but if you read the books, you'll see that that's what I do. And I have read the books, and I have yeah. to agree that it's, it, it's true. We're, we're running a little short of time, so I wanted to take some time to ask you. You talk about when you finish a book, mm -hmm. and you start writing another book. Well, now we are now seeing Monstrous Regiments, which means you are already in the midst of another book. Can you tell us anything about it? Well, I've already, already written the next children's book, which is uh, a sequel to The We Free Men. That's called A Hat Full of Sky. And I'm now 
about 20,000 words into Going Postal, which is the Discworld book for the fall of next year. Yeah, I thought they'd get a laugh. But we know the term in the UK as well. Um, and, and I'm having some fun with it, and I'm actually working on it while I'm on tour. Uh, my, my editor rather liked the title, I have to say. Well, Mr. Pratchett, we're almost out of time. I, thank you very much for coming by. Thank you very much for 31 opportunities to <laughs> lose myself in another world and enjoy myself totally. It, it, it's a delight, and, it, and I'm happy that you, as an obsessive compulsive workaholic, will continue to supply me with my drugs on a regular basis. Thank you. And thank you, sir, again. Well, that's it for this edition of Fast Forward. Hope you found something of interest. Hope you'll come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Shod saying, Take care.